Well, good morning, my Lord Bishop, members of Synod and honored guests. Good to be with you for the final part of my hat trick. Before I uh, proceed, I um, want to acknowledge some people. Um, presenting like this uh, takes certain resource persons in the background, and I did express my gratitude to the sound text the other day. Anything can happen up here, good or bad. The thing is, we need them to help the message get out. So I'd like you to acknowledge their efforts. Thank you. I've worked soundboards and done lighting in theater and in other ways in the church, and I've done work with computers, and I'm profoundly grateful to Kendall. And I don't know if you have a team with you or not, but um, she organized, sorry? Chris. Chris, Kendall and Chris. A large amount of organization, management of technical details. Um, the work that these folks do, it's like altar guilds. When, you, um, when all is going well, you're not aware it's happening. The only time you're aware that they're even there is when something is not happening when it should be. And I have not been aware of things not happening. It's been very easy for me as your guest and a presenter to come here and know that the equipment is ready and organized. So I do applaud you both and thank you for your efforts. Well, this morning is all about story, and if you remember nothing else, and I'm ready to go to the uh, PowerPoint now, um, it's all about story. In some ways, the themes that I present today will be somewhat similar to what we uh, experienced yesterday. But I first begin with some quotes, a couple of very short and quick quotes. You know, in parish life, you see people doing things, maybe you're doing things, but you watch others, and you go, why are they doing that? Can they not step back? and look at this particular conflict or challenge somewhat objectively, can they examine what's going on? Take a step back, take a deep breath, and then enter the situation in a new and fresh way. That's what I think we need to do with regard to environment and climate justice response. Also a phrase which is more a bumper sticker than original Gandhian writing, though it's based on the spirit of Gandhi's writings, be the change you want to see in the world. Uh, what we hear often from governments in all levels of jurisdiction is, we'll do something when the other guys do. Canada will respond when the US, and the US will respond when China and India, and it goes on and on passing the buck. What did was it Roosevelt or Truman said the buck stops here and friends with us as Anglican Christians in this and other dioceses, the buck stops with us. I'm part of a preaching mentor group. I'm not the mentor, I'm one of the participants and we've been given a large number of books to read before we gather and one of the books we have just read or I just read is written by a woman named Bobette Buster. Now with a name like that, it's gotta be interesting. She's an Australian, she's a screenwriter and she's a storyteller. And again, I'm talking about story this morning and here's what she says. Stories are always about transformation. Whether we know it or not, whatever the story we are telling, we are always sharing a threshold moment. This means that we are at a crossroads in our life, a turning point, a fork in the road. This threshold is a call for us to wake up or to rise to a challenge before us. Fundamentally, we are being called to change, to discover the courage to become our best self. I mean, that could be an exclusively humanistic statement, but I think it works for those of us comfortable with and formed by the life of Christ. It's picking up on Irenaeus, you know, the glory of humanity, the glory of God, rather, is humanity fully alive. Stories. I know I'm going to get asked when I arrive back in Victoria tonight at about uh, 10 o'clock local time, what's it like in the Diocese of Huron? And I'm going to tell them a story. And I'm going to say that the night before the last day of Synod, I was in this banquet hall. <laughs> and it was a wonderful meal. And then I remember there appeared before my eyes and the congregation there gathered two beans. <laughs> and one was white. And one was dark. And the dark one looked very weird <laughs> and acted in a most extraordinary fashion until the white 
and the light overcame the darkness. <laughs> and he took center stage, and he gesticulated, and he genuflected, and he lowered himself to a point where he said and uttered these words, I hope my pants do not split. <laughs> and then there appeared behind him a chorus of nymph-like creatures, <laughs> who as the waters flowed, themselves flowed from side to side. And later on that same evening, a purple thing appeared. <laughs> and he had on his head something that looked like a black mop. <laughs> and he had on these glasses which obscured his eyes through which he viewed the world, albeit dimly. <laughs> and he said to the group then assembled, I want to tell you a story about Chesley. We all use stories. Scripture, even in its most dogmatic and code-like sense, is telling us an arrangement of data which we have received, which we have formed into stories and passed from one generation to another generation. We have a story to tell, a story of transformation about the earth, and in a few moments' time I'll share with you what's called the post-Hubble narrative which is a different way of telling the story of the last 20 years. Stay tuned. But first, here's another story. It's in the poetry of an American poet named Mary Oliver. Maybe you know this story. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. So tell me about your despair, yours and I will tell you mine, and meanwhile the world goes on. Meanwhile the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. It calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. Poetry, how we can use poetry in our proclamation, whether we're preachers, whether we're small group leaders, clergy or laity, whether we're musicians, and wasn't that proclamation of Sirach the other night with Angus improvising under it, I was absolutely transported. And while we may not have those resources, I don't have those resources to use in my local parish at home, well, maybe I do. Maybe I'm going to go home and try to do that be a little bit more multimedia in our proclamation. And again, Mary Oliver encourages us to recover or rediscover our place in the order of things. Not as master and the one who controls environment, but the one who is interdependent with creation. And we let this affect the way we invest our money, the way we use our time, the way we travel, the way we support uh, secular and sacred interest groups and develop partnerships between the NGO community and our own parish and local faith communities. Julian of Norwich, ancient mystic, woman speaking in a particular medieval darkness. See, I am God. I am in everything. See, I never lift my hand off my works, nor will I ever. See, I lead everything toward the purpose for which I ordained it. Remember yesterday we talked about creation, a sense of it emerging through rest, moving towards its perfection. Julian gives us a different way of saying the same thing. Now sometimes I use words, sometimes I use images, and sometimes I get props. And in the procession on Sunday night, one of the clergy had this uh, beautiful stole, 
with hands. And I said, I can use that, can I borrow it? Actually, the first thing I said is, can I have that? And he said, no, but <laughs> anyway. And I've forgotten your name, but it'll be at the table, I promise, before I leave today, but thank you again. Here are these words from St. Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body now but ours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks, compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. Oh, wow, wow. These mystics give us a story rooted in their own experience, and now I'd like to share with you my story. I, um, I've never ridden a motorcycle. I'm not a great full gospel business person after dinner speaker. Uh, once when I was in Watson Lake in the Yukon, the women's aglow group asked me to share my faith story. So I came and did it, and what an absolute total yawn fest. I had no exciting news. I hadn't given up drugs, sex, or rock and roll. Um, there was just nothing to report Batman on that particular time. But things have changed in a most unusual way, and remember God is a surprise. I did grow up in the church, and I grew up in leadership in the church as a choir boy at St. John the Divine in Victoria, B.C. in Canada. And as I meet with people around the world, I'm fascinated to discover people who are in significant leadership positions. In nine times out of ten, they started in some church-related music endeavor. Someone should study that, get a Canada Council grant. Leadership and the influence of morning prayer in Canadian youth between the years of 1963 and 1988, something like that. Go for it, see if you can get funding. Ever since I was a child, I always wanted to play the organ, and so I endured the drudgery of piano because I wanted to play the organ, and I was able to do that, thank God. In the early days of my organ studies, I was asked to accompany uh, a Lenten service on a Wednesday afternoon, and once again, oh my gosh, it was boring, B-O-R-I-N-G. But someone had given me, I think my mother had given me, at that time, the New Testament in the New International Version. The Old Testament hadn't been published yet. It was brand new, so I opened it up to Matthew chapter 5, and I heard those words, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. Blessed are you who are hungry. And the you jumped off the page at me, and it was an arresting moment. And I had, in an almost Wesleyan way, a profound spiritual awakening as that most boring of services continued. It was wonderful. I've obviously never forgotten it. I studied music in England, then I came here to London, as I shared earlier. I went north as a lay missionary in the Yukon Apostolate. I was ordained and served in three parishes over, that's about a 15-year period there. And when I was in Souk, I encountered in 1992 what was called the War in the Woods. And as a parish priest who was becoming somewhat environmentally aware, and as one who was becoming increasingly concerned about what I learned about assimilationalist politics within the church and within Canadian culture, I was becoming aware of a divide between Indigenous and non-Indigenous persons. The war in the woods was interesting on the West Coast. You had environmentalists which tended to be urban-based, and you had folks who made their living out of the resource industry, either in fishing or in logging. And that was the time when Clackwood Sound was the point of controversy, and thousands of people, including Anglican laity and clergy, were arrested for civil disobedience and contempt of court. And I made my fledgling sermons talking about justice in creation. But the big move was 2001, when I went to a course with the Irish Roman Catholic Dermot O'Murku, if he comes to your region, go, go, go one of the clearest and finest teachers I've ever met and heard in my life. He takes abstract concepts, breaks them down. He's a sociologist, he understands how people learn. No session is more than 50, five zero minutes, and you'll hang on every word guaranteed. 
he transformed my understanding and appreciation of the Judeo-Christian tradition by expanding it both backward and forward. And he gave a clarion call for justice. And I describe that as my second conversion and my true rebirth in Christ. At the same time, I was nominated and sent off to General Synod on behalf of the Diocese of Kootenai. My D Bishop David said, go and speak to motions, get discovered, and get elected to a standing committee. So I stood in a lineup at a microphone, and Phyllis Creighton was ahead of you. Some of you know who she is, a very stalwart justice advocate. I can't now to this day remember what she was talking about. I didn't know what she was talking about at the time, but I got elected. I put myself out there feeling unprepared. And that unpreparedness continued in the weeks and months to come. I was elected to two terms on the Echo Justice Committee. I remember phoning my wife and saying to her, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what they're talking about. I just so hope that I can come home soon. Then there was the first global Anglican Congress on the stewardship of creation. What a mouthful, and it doesn't reduce to an acronym in any way in 2002 in Johannesburg, South Africa. The uh, head of our environmental subgroup didn't want to go. He was a professional um, uh, working with uh, Agriculture Canada and he'd had enough of conferences, so I went. I phoned my wife and I said, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know what they're talking about. I really hope I can come home soon. Um, God is a surprise. If you think you're going to leave here today fully equipped to do something tomorrow, you're probably not going to do it and you will be disappointed. If my story has any value to you whatsoever, step out in faith and courage and take your lumps when they come, and they will. But God, in calling the young Jeremiah and Isaiah and others, it was never an easy call. We read the words on the page and we think, well, done deal. Who would say no? Well, there's all sorts of reasons to say no. I can't do this. I'm too young. I'm inexperienced. Someone else will do it. Garbage. The call is to you as it was to me. And opportunity after opportunity have come my way over these years. I'm sharing with you my personal faith story as I'm encouraging you in the time we have left and in the drive back home to think about your faith story and how environment intersects with that. And we do it through the asking of questions, and these questions are taken from David Atkinson's article, and I remind you that that's on the website. I encourage you to download that. If it would be helpful to you, I'm willing to prepare a study guide, and you can use it in your parishes. Let me know. Send me $50. Just joking. Just <laughs> joking. Questions that we can use to become more comfortable with and familiar with our own faith story. What sort of trust should we place in technology? And are we secretly hoping that a technical fix will be the answer to the climate crisis? Read Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything. She has a huge chapter on the nutso things that people are coming up with. Instead of dealing with the problem, they're treating the symptoms. One of the hardest funerals I ever did was in my last parish in the Okanagan, and it was a double murder. An estranged husband returned to the community, unknown to anyone. And he went to the house where his wife and his mother lived together with two young children who were about six and eight years old. And he murdered in front of the children, the mother and the grandmother. The children, after that had happened, were on their own. And they saw their parent and grandparent on the floor. And they saw blood coming from wounds. And they went to the bathroom to get band-aids to put the band-aids on fatal wounds. We cannot put band-aids on the fatal wounds of our world, of God's creation. This is not a time for half measures. It's a time for courage and a sense of true adventure, the sort of spiritual adventure that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob entered into and the sort of adventure that Jesus was willing to accept as he prayed in Jerusalem. Let us not be as the disciples who couldn't even stay awake to consider the consequences. Use these questions 
to probe and articulate and learn your own story so that we can encourage one another. What are our responsibilities to the parts of the world that are poorer and have done little to cause the damage to our atmosphere and are the least able to adapt? The more you travel, the more you'll be able to witness these things firsthand. My wife and I are hoping to take a tour to South Africa in 2017. Uh, it's an amazing country. We absolutely love it, and we have a close affinity with it. There you can see the largest wealth in the world and some of the most horrendous poverty and experience the tension between the two. Sometimes we have to go out of our way to learn about the fullness of life. How do we let future generations speak to us of their needs? And I certainly appreciated Bishop God, uh, God, <laughs> Bob's comment the other night about his grandchildren. I'll never live that one down, you know. It is our carbon emissions that will be around in their world. There's a justice thing from generation to generation here. And how do we handle our fears? I mean, these are challenging times for sure. And the word fear, I think, is appropriate. Thomas Merton talks about fear in relation to war. Why do people try to annihilate each other? Because they cannot imagine a reconciled world. And thus they act out of fear in protectionist modes to the point of murder. Where does fear fit in with the climate crisis? And how do we respond? I was speaking about this yesterday. I do it through a slightly different mode this morning. These first words, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Does anyone recognize what they are? They're Kubler-Ross's stages of death and dying. Yeah, and isn't it interesting? As we grieve the loss of a world which may be seemed innocent or a little simpler or less complex, we react. And many of us deny what's going on or we react in anger. I don't want to hear that talk anymore. People are not interested in that. Or we bargain. We say, well, you know, I'll cut back a little bit, but, you know, someone else will do more, you know. We get depressed. We get overwhelmed. I've been that route. Don't go that way, friends. Get help. Intervene early. And maybe we find and hopefully we find acceptance. And maybe we need, uh, we move through a different cluster of words and experience. We find ourselves motivated. We focus, we engage, we strategize together. I heard some of that happening yesterday. And by the way, the uh, PDF copy of the Prezi presentation that I shared yesterday is available for you to take home. And so you've got all those options that we shared in that fun format yesterday. We discover new community. I invited Irene to share with you photographically. She's a woman with faith community connections, but the Anglican uh, world was new to her. She was reasonably impressed, by the way, so well done. Um, courage, courage. I think of the Wizard of Oz, the cowardly lion. What did he seek? He sought courage so he could continue along the long yellow brick road. Still thinking story, but a different kind of story, and this is the post-Hubble narrative now. Hubble, of course, is that telescope in space, photographing space. It's been up 20 years, and it's nearing the end of its operational life. But it speaks to a generation who is much younger than myself. There are some people in our churches who have never known a pre-Hubble world. And so I share here with you a presentation given by Bishop, Bishop Nicholas Holton, he is the lead bishop in the Church of England for the environment. He was one of our echo bishops present in Cape Town. He quotes Bishop Tom Wilmot, who's the bishop of the gold fields in Perth in Australia. And Tom developed what he called a post-Hubble narrative. So we have our creation stories in Genesis, two of them, and we have the story from uh, John chapter 1 of God moving spiritually around the face of the earth. The post-Hubble narrative is similar to these, except that it describes what's been happening since the Hubble telescope went into space. Uh, Nick Holtom also talks a little bit about the Echo Bishops gathering. So um, could we have video clip number two, please? Thank you. Um, I went on a really good conference of Anglican bishops with a responsibility for the environment in their different provinces. Um, there were 17 of us from around the world. Uh, they included a bishop from the Philippines, from Fiji, uh, as well as the Bishop of New York and Hong Kong. Uh, great diversity within the group. And we'd been doing conferencing 
uh, by video, and which, which, which had been pretty unsuccessful, truthfully. Um, but meeting face to face was transformative for us as a group, and it gave us a great deal of confidence in each other and energy. A bishop from Perth, uh, Bishop Tom Wilmot, who's the Bishop of the Goldfield in Western Australia, uh, he produced something which he described as a post Hubble creation narrative. Here it is. The universe is unimaginably large, birthed 13.7 billion years ago. Our solar system is so big we are never going to leave it. This little blue planet, Earth, our home, possesses the right combination of elements for carbon-based life forms. It has a liquid iron core which produces an electromagnetic shield against cosmic radiation. A habitable atmosphere produced by blue-green algae over a billion years ago, when our oceans were large, stagnant, acidic. Ponds. Blue-green algae took the carbon dioxide by photosynthesis out of the then toxic atmosphere and sequestered it in what we now extract and burn as fossil fuels. Burning fossil fuels releases this sequestered carbon back into the atmosphere, reversing the chemical process that originally made the planet conducive to life. We have changed the chemical composition of the planet from 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide, which ice cores samples demonstrate has been the ratio for 850,000 years, from 280 parts per million of, of carbon dioxide to 400 parts per million in the last 150 years. We're currently pumping 90 million tons of CO2 into the air each day. The energy equivalent of that, the, the, the energy release of that is equivalent to 400,000 Hiroshima's every day. The, the violence of that is, is so striking that you can, well, I, I think it's the most vivid uh, image I've got of the violence done, being done uh, to God's creation. So I think the post-Hubble creation narrative sets a scene in terms of where we are and what we're doing. Uh, and that uh, image uh, of uh, violence through the energy equivalent each day uh, is so breathtaking that it sort of highlights the problem. A post-Hubble narrative, a new way of framing and um, summarizing what is going on, connecting with debates around the way carbon is extracted and the effects of carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, we can make, I can put the copy of that clip also on your website if that's helpful to you. David Atkinson. Hope in God motivates us to take action that can lead to transformation. Despite the strong probability of very serious effects from global warming, for Christians, despair is not an option. We are called to live and work with hope in response to God's gift, and in the light of God's future, the promised coming of Christ's reign over all. That comes from Operation Noah's Ash Wednesday Declaration. Friends, my challenge to you is in asking you to reflect on your own story is to ask you to do the work of defining and becoming aware of your own faith story. And in particular, asking you to consider where is creation right now within this story? I hope I've been able to prod you in the direction of insight. How will you express your revitalized and more inclusive faith story and to whom? Because frankly, all is lost if you don't share this experience. Like I know we're all gonna go home and talk about Elvis, but let's go talk about a few other things, please. And how will you take this experience back to your parish or region? I have two suggestions. One is of course that you make that call, that you fill out the Enviro Action form. And even if you just put your contact information 
on that sheet and hand it into the Enviro Action table. At the very least, you've made a contact which hasn't been a real contact for you in the past. If you've had contact, ask yourself how you and a parish can take a step further. And one thing I do recommend is the book Living Ecological Justice. I know you've heard about it before. I've only just discovered it. I would say it's the most concise, reasonable, balanced, and practical and useful tool available to us in the Canadian church today. You can use it for worship, you can use it for studies, you can use it for your own personal edification, you can use it for political and social analysis. It's a gold mine, it's available on the Citizens for Public Justice website. So friends, there is a prayer before us and as I draw my third and final presentation to a close, I invite you to join me in this prayer and after that, I think Bishop Bob will return to the chair and in viral action with whose uh, shirt I am wearing with pride and will continue on the plane today um, that they, um, that, um, well, they'll do their thing. Friends, let's pray together. O oh God, who set before us, oh, it'd help if you had it in front of you, wouldn't it? There we are, together. O oh God, who set before us the great hope that your kingdom shall come on earth and taught us to pray for its coming. Give us grace to discern the signs of its dawn and to work for the perfect day when the whole earth shall reflect your glory. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for your kind welcome and your good uh, attention. God bless you all.